Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who survived the knockout round. His <laughs> name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. Somehow I have all these bruises and like cuts all over my legs. <laughs> I feel like there are sympathy pains, but either way, I did survive. So we saw, um, actually I was going to say we saw all four games. Mm-hmm. That is not true in my case, no? um, of the MLS playoff knockout round, I couldn't watch uh, Portland v Dallas. Why is that? Because I think either I made a huge mm-hmm. mistake and it was only on Unimas um, and then not replayed, mm-hmm. or ESPN Plus made a huge mistake and forgot to add it to the archive. Are you so stressed out about that that you have to hold the top of your head for the duration of the podcast? Stop my brain exploding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I did enjoy... Slightly your increasing frustration with this because I tend to go real hot real fast. Like last night I was try- I switched from uh, Fox Soccer Match Pass to ESPN Plus for mm-hmm. the second uh, game on we Thursday night. We live in the night. future, by the way. Yeah, we do. Uh, and it refused. It kept asking me to like show which cable I use or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. No matter what, it just kept going back to that. And I went from... Like, oh, what a lovely convenience it is to watch soccer whenever I want to. I will break everything, and I hate all things. Usually you don't go that route, but I feel like you got a little frustrated. But you didn't break everything. No, I did not. (laughs) And I did see three games which we can talk about in detail. I guess Portland-Dallas. Honestly, it's probably the least interesting of the three games, if we're honest. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just ask you questions about it. Sure. Yeah? Um, Okay. And I'll do my best to answer. We're also going to be looking at these games, I think, from a U.S. men's national team Mm -hmm. Perspective, which I think is really important in the uh, the DC Columbus game, giving the uh, possible future US men's national team head coach uh-huh. and some of the players involved in that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, shall we go chronological? Though? Let's do it. Okay. So the first knockout round game um, of the uh, on the slate mm-hmm. was NYCFC hosting Philadelphia Union. It finished three one to NYCFC. But it was over pretty fast. It was. Uh, yeah, 10th right? minute, uh, Ismael Tajiri Shradi with a great goal, a mm-hmm. lovely goal, taking nothing away from him. But I feel like the narrative for me about this game is the Philadelphia Union defense, specifically uh, Austin Trusty and McKenzie. They were yes. not very good. So I was excited to watch mm-hmm. them, and um, it, it hurt a little bit to see them get shredded to pieces. Yes, yeah? forgive me, I forgot his first name. Austin Trusty and Mark McKenzie? Mark McKenzie, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, McKenzie especially, I felt like, because we've had scouting reports throughout the season about Trusty, and a lot of them related to, and he had to put out a few fires from McKenzie, or he helped <laughs> McKenzie, or he cheated over to help McKenzie. Yeah. And, it, and this was the first time I've really paid attention to that backline pairing, mm-hmm. and I saw the problems there, and I saw what happens when basically Trusty is himself man-marking and dealing with a lot of pressure. He can't really help cover. And a lot of these goals come from McKenzie giving the ball away, playing hospital passes, yep. uh, tracking back too deeply, and thus keeping players on the side. Yep. It was not a very good game for him. I will say, though, it's not as if this is just uh, Mark McKenzie was a walking mm-hmm. disaster and it's all his fault. Yeah. Um, I look at this game as... Philadelphia tried to play their passing game yeah. and they tried to play it on that tiny, tiny pitch, True. which is at most 70 mm-hmm. yards wide, which is the <laughs> league minimum. Yeah. It may be less. I'd like to measure it myself. And it's just the wrong game to play on that field. And it Absolutely. was too easy for NYCFC to um, pressure them, intercept some passes and immediately quickly counterattack and, and tear Philly apart that yeah. way. That's what happened on all three goals, I believe. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and, and it felt like we saw on social media that Philadelphia had like reduced their training pitch size to yes. kind of get used to it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of when we play games uh, in our amateur adult league. That's a fair comparison for MLS playoffs. <laughs> um, and like if the grass hasn't been <laughs> cut... Before we get to it, you meant that sarcastic. I did. <laughs> um, anytime I compare our amateur level to playoffs or anything like that, I'm always aware of how <laughs> foolish I might sound. Um, but like it reminds me of when the grass is really high and so we tell our teammates like hey you're gonna have to put a little bit more behind this ball to make sure it gets there in this case it felt like philly had practiced on the smaller dimensions and had adjusted by like okay we can't hit this ball as hard and so it felt like routinely (laughs) they were under hitting passes maybe just because they weren't quite used to the field dimensions didn't want to hit them out of bounds didn't want to give any turnovers but instead they gave a lot of turnovers by misplacing passes they did and what they didn't have when Mm -hmm. they practiced to play nycfc on this tiny field they didn't have a yangel herrera they did not (laughs) roaming around winning the ball all the time my goodness that that is one of the big keys to this game is 20 year old venezuelan central midfielder on loan from man city yangel herrera was absolutely key to devouring he was like a shark he devoured everything Every ball that Philly tried to play through the central midfield, Yango Herrera got it. Yeah, I mean, Benjamin Mendy applauded from uh, his home <laughs> in, Manchester, in, in Manchester. Such was his shark performance. Uh, yeah, because in this first goal, it's a great finish, obviously. But the thing that I love about it is Herrera is involved in the giveaway from NYCFC to begin with. It's yeah, not yeah. his fault. I think it's a bad pass to him. 
but he has a really good positional recovery to like move over 10 yards to fill space. Then he steps and intercepts the ball from McKinsey and launches the counterattack that leads to the goal. So it's just how those little tiny decisions and then great defensive plays yeah, snowball yeah. into amazing goals. So I've got a question for you on this mm-hmm. goal. It's not Herrera-related. Uh, it's David Villar-related. Yeah. Did he mean to do what he did, which was essentially jump over the ball and not touch it? Uh, I know. I think he definitely <laughs> meant to redirect it, but he basically ended up – the ball went where I think he kind of wanted to hit it anyway. Yeah. So he won't get the credit for the assist, and I'm not sure he makes any contact, yeah. but Max, it Max still Morales, clever. Maxi Morales gets the official assist because after Ter- uh, Herrera lays it back, he sort of loops it. Yeah. Over you know what? It's top. David Villa. Let's just say even though he didn't make a touch, he like totally meant to do it, and it was just a very dramatic <laughs> dummy. There you go. I think he was aiming for Mato. He's just that good. He's just that good. Mm-hmm. Um, for the second goal, David Villa definitely gets the credit because yeah. he put the ball in the back of he the He did. Net. He did. But your eye was caught by someone else on this play. Uh, that'd be Matarita. Yeah. Matarita, I felt like, did a good job. In the same way that Herrera was doing a very good job of covering and, and like blocking off options and then mm-hmm. putting people under pressure. Here, Matarita does that same thing. He's kind of all over the field uh, taking away options for Philly. But he's also helping organize his team because I think Ben Sweat comes running out when Matarita has asked him to stay back. Yep. So then Matarita fills in for Ben Sweat. Mm-hmm. Does when, his job for him. Yeah. And then yeah. one of the center backs steps out. Matarita slides over and covers that space then eventually he steps out and wins the ball launches the counterattack. so it just felt like a lot of the players who needed to be doing solid defensive work for NYCFC did exactly that and yep. allowed that attack to be as ruthless and potent as it was what do you make of McKenzie and Trusty on this second goal this David Vega goal I know Trusty gets nutmeg by Morales mm-hmm. uh, going across and like I'm wondering what you think especially of McKenzie's uh, shape because I couldn't tell what he was trying to do uh, it, was, it was pretty bad in my opinion because I think McKenzie he kind of like steps at the wrong time and thus then loses Morales because Morales makes that run down the channel and kind of effectively cuts out McKinsey. I think he then doesn't notice David Villa and is very slow to move back to the center because Trusty has come across to cover. Yeah. And it was sort of McKinsey once again not being as like sharp as you need to be in the playoffs in those moments to make sure that a player like David Villa isn't mm-hmm. open to get the ball and score. So I want to talk big picture about mm-hmm. this because to me this game's over uh, at yeah. 2 no, It never looked like Philly would be able to pass the ball on that small pitch without yeah. NYCFC taking it off of them, which is basically mm-hmm. what happened for the rest of the game, right? Um, how do we feel, and I don't know the answer, how do we feel about the whole hashtag play your kids thing yeah. where you've got a teenage centre-back, McKenzie, mm-hmm. and a like 21, I think, year old, uh, or 20 or 21-year-old centre-back in Austin Trusty mm-hmm. had a lot of experience, a lot of good moments this year in Major League Soccer, but when they come up against David Villa and Maxi Morales, when it's all on the line, they got they got ripped apart. Yes. So does that mean that they basically aren't ready, aren't good enough? Or does it mean that uh, it was a good experience all along? Uh, I mean, things can be two oh, things, I guess, the cheap I answer. Cry, I will cry into that one, don't I? You really did. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a good experience and it allowed them to get a lot of minutes and obviously get a lot of playing time to figure out how better to play. But mm-hmm. I think once you enter the playoffs, and I think the same can be said for the Columbus crew against DC United, Playoffs is where you, where your dreams take root. I don't know. That's uh, paraphrasing the terrible George did, Bush quote. Did Soccer United Marketing tell you to say that? There we go. Uh, <laughs> no, maybe. Maybe they did. I'll take that check off air. Uh, no, but it, it's where basically I think you – I almost think of it like this. Like MLS is sort of a marathon to get to the end. And so along the way you're sort of, oh, I need to hydrate a little bit. Oh, I need uh-huh. to change this. I need to – whatever you need to do to survive. And once you get to playoffs, that's where it becomes like, Okay, now we have our 40 page dossier on each team. It's just like you do the 26 point something miles. And then yeah. as you get to the finish line, someone goes sprint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's more so like, no, it's like you do the 26 <laughs> and then the final point two is an obstacle course. I see. But you can actually yeah. prepare for the obstacle yeah, yeah. course. And that's what the playoffs feel like is you can look at that Philadelphia team if you're NYCFC and think, those are two very young center backs. If we put them under pressure, if we isolate them and put them in 1v1 scenarios, they're maybe going to feel that pressure a bit more because it's the playoffs and because it's in New York against David Villa and Morales. And I mm-hmm. think that's exactly what happens. So while it's a very good season for them, I think you saw some of the inexperience and vulnerability here. Even the first goal, like Austin Trusty does what he can to make make up, like to make a play on David Villa, but he tries to make a play at the wrong time. He sprints back to, try, to cover David Villa. Yeah. And when that ball goes into him and he doesn't get that touch, I still think if Trusty doesn't make that, V is offside, and I think he gets flagged for offside because yeah. he's interfering doesn't, in the play. Um, I actually haven't seen this goal mm-hmm. since the time, but I think – doesn't he like step too high, then yep. drop too deep? Exactly. It's almost like he makes two only slightly wrong decisions, exactly. but they add up to David Villa getting space yeah. to – Essentially dummy it in the end, mm-hmm. but, it, but it worked, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think that's why I do enjoy uh, the playoffs from a U.S. national team perspective because I think this 
is like, you know, the most pressure these players are going to be under, especially mm-hmm. at this young age. And to see how they respond or don't respond and to see some of the vulnerabilities, it gives you the kind of baseboard for where to go from here. And so if we watch them again in the playoffs next season, we can see, oh, Trusty didn't yeah. make that run or he was a little bit more organized or McKenzie didn't misplay that pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it for me, too, that you mm-hmm. um, the whole play your kids thing yeah. is is really like it's not like we expect them to immediately be world beaters. Yeah. Right. To to take on World Cup winning strikers. It's more the... Uh, was we in the 2010 World Cup? Uh, sure. European Championship winning strikers, yeah. at least, um, and immediately be good enough. But we do expect maybe mm-hmm. year on year on year, we see them slowly get better before our eyes, right? Yes, yeah. 100%. Um, I would say, though, strangely, with NYCFC winning 3-1, to one, uh, it did feel for a moment like it was, the mo- it was going to be the most comprehensive victory for a team in this round of the playoffs. You think like after the Maxi Morales lob goal, yeah. which is beautiful, by the way. It sure was. You, were you expecting maybe two, three more to, I to, did. to rain down? But there yeah. were still moments where I think uh, a lot of the teams that won and advanced to the next round did show their vulnerabilities. And I think that goal from Philly, oh, yeah. it doesn't end up mattering. <laughs> but I took a screenshot of it. We can post it on Instagram or something. There are seven NYCFC players paying attention to Ilsenio while yep. Corey Burke and somebody else are just wide open in the middle of the box. Mm-hmm. Like, and I mean wide open. Like No one even knows they're there. That's where that goal comes from. And I think that relates to uh, Ilsenio did that to NYCFC in the regular season. So I didn't know this. This is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was in the, like, the highlights package of like great goals from the season gone by, and he kind of slaloms through them and scores. And it felt like the New York defenders were paranoid of that happening again. So everybody did what we've seen defenders do a lot to Leo Messi, which is like everybody steps to him, yeah. but then nobody steps to him, and they leave that room but if we have strength in numbers in a big circle around him how will they ever find a space oh we found the space like that's what it felt like and so the weird I, part to me is that both center backs went over to yeah. towards the wing essentially yeah, yeah. and so if, if, if the field had like suddenly tilted maybe it did maybe that <laughs> yeah. was the problem that's another feature of yankee stadium that we didn't know about it's also a pinball field um uh, tilt and game over um but it, it did feel like a thing well, that a very bad pool table yeah perfect <laughs> I was about to make a very specific Sopranos reference that won't relate at all. So we'll just keep moving to say that if you're Atlanta, uh, I would maybe look at that and think, you know what? I want to maybe exploit that a little bit and oh. and I want to maybe have some of my more creative players try to dribble inside the box or right around the box and see what comes of it. We'll see if Miggy Amaran's back then for yeah. NYCFC versus um, Atlanta. Maybe a little more on that later. Before we move on, yeah. I, f- I feel that we're coming towards the end of this. Maybe. I have, I have. have. We probably need to give a little bit more credit to Maxi Morales. That's the only other thing I want to do in this round. Oh, go for it then. Okay. What would you like to J- say? Just because like, we talked about the lob, we ended like – very quickly talked about his role in the second goal, yeah, especially. Yeah, he nutmeg yeah. Dustin Trusty. But just how like clever and clinical he was. Like that pass is inch perfect for the second goal. The third goal obviously is a beautiful lob, but I kind of assumed that it was like, oh, he's played in. Uh, Andre Blake is kind of stranded and can't really do anything about it. Watch it again, Andre Blake really does approach this about as perfectly as you can. (laughs) He's off his line, but he doesn't do the thing that goalkeepers sometimes do where they're off their line too quickly, and then they're kind of standing at the top of the box and don't know what to do. He times it perfectly. So he's at full momentum, full speed, and really puts himself in the best possible position to make a play. And I think if Morales hits it anywhere else or any other way, this ball is saved. But Morales has that awareness. It looks like he's hit it too high as Mm -hmm. well, which I think is testament to what a good job Blake has done, is that Morales has to go that high to get it over him. Yes. But it still comes down. It still comes down. And as is tradition... got that gravity uh, figured out. (laughs) He sure does. And as is tradition in this review, at least, also worth noting... This comes about, I kept trying to figure out how is it possible. It's a great ball from Tenerom, don't get me wrong, but why is this ball so on? The answer is because uh, I believe it was Austin Trusty had stepped out on the, kind of like, because Austin Trusty was the right center back, so he was maybe 20, 30 yards, probably 30 yards away from Morales. He had stepped forward. McKenzie had stayed deep. Morales had found the space in between, uh, similar to what Christian Ramirez did for the LAFC goal. Mm-hmm. He kind of finds that space, gets the ball, and only has one defender to beat that time, and uh, ably does just that. It's worth mentioning the ball was also on because that field is so short. Well, there's that too. Right? The counterattacks come thick and fast because there's not that much distance to cover yeah. from, from, the middle, from, from the middle to the goal. You're not right? wrong. You're not yeah. wrong. Um, final thing I want to mention is um, I did say that this fell over at 2-0. Mm-hmm. There was a way back into the game when Ben Sweat decided to go all in on a big slide tackle on Alejandro Bedoya. Mm-hmm. Bedoya got the cross away. Yep. 
but Sweat definitely fouls him in the box. 100%. I really think that should have been a penalty kick. I agree. And I know there was a lot of debate about this one on Twitter. Taylor Twelman said it should have been a penalty. A lot of people responded to that, pointing out that Corey Burke on the resulting shot was offside, and that's why the flag was given. So? Doesn't matter to me. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is an example of, I watched the referee. He does not give any indicator of play on. He doesn't do that like, oh, I was going to call mm-hmm. it, but no, never mind. You still have the ball. So I think he just thinks there's no foul there. I think he thinks that like, oh, the, the pass was delivered. Ben Sweat just made a challenge. There's a little bit of contact there. That's the weird part about it, right? Is that because the pass was delivered, I could see how the referee then looks at what's happening yeah. in the middle of the box mm-hmm. rather than looking at Ben Sweat going charging in and not, not getting the ball, but very much getting the man. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and I think in at least three of the four uh, first round playoff games, it felt like referees were sort of seeing stuff like that and thinking like, oh, that's just a little bit of contact mm-hmm. in a way that when you go back and watch like the Leeds teams, like the uh, the nasty Leeds or whatever teams, that it sort of is like, that was allowed? Like that guy just scissor tackled somebody from behind away from the ball. Like a Billy Bremner tackle. Yeah. yeah. Like there were moments like that where I was just like, <laughs> you're letting that go? And I do think... A lot of times when you have players, like it starts to boil over and players get physical and shove or put in like really reckless challenges. Yeah, that's on the player for making that decision. But I think a huge burden of responsibility is on the referee. If you start letting those tackles go and letting those challenges fly, why would people stop doing it? If anything, it's going to escalate. Yeah. And I feel like three of the four games referees didn't really stamp their authority and that bled into the overall quality of the game. I think that is that's a fair, fair comment. Mm-hmm. All right. But Anything sp- else on this game? No, but I do want to talk about things that are of high quality. Oh, do you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, before we move on to talk about the later games, mm-hmm. today's show is sponsored by a new Total Soccer Show sponsor. It is. You you missed my uh, my seamless connection here. Oh, I, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today's show is sponsored by Loop Jewelry. I don't want to be friends um, with you anymore. <laughs> Loop is engagement ring shopping mm-hmm. for the modern couple. Um, basically, it's one-on-one guidance from real people. They will walk you through the engagement ring shopping process. Mm-hmm. So there's less of the standing around sweating, thinking, is this the right thing? What are yep. we going to do? Loop Jewelry has someone who will show you what's best. Which is uh, very much appreciated when I was designing uh, my wife's engagement ring. Uh, I was very fortunate enough, uh, my mother-in-law, now mother-in-law, uh, had a friend who oh, designed... So, so it worked out. He did. Uh, <laughs> she had a friend who designed jewelry. So he, uh, he helped me through this process because okay. I tried it on my own. I'm not good at this. It's very hard. There are uh-huh. many, many options to the point where it gives you a headache. Yep. So I was fortunate enough to have that uh, advice. And now I feel like people will be fortunate enough to have Loop because they provide that exact same level of insight. Yep. These are diamond industry pros mm-hmm. who have left their corporate jewelry gigs behind um, but still maintain all the old contacts. Yeah, yeah, corporate jewelry gigs. Who needs those? So they can get they can still get these top tier rings mm-hmm. um, at a discount, but they can uh, bring them to you and talk you through the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, so that means – but. Key point with the talking you through the whole thing, that also means you're not getting like an elaborate sales pitch constantly. You're not getting a lot of technical jargon. No BS. No BS. You're just getting (laughs) uh, help and insight from professionals. So if you go to loopjewelry.com slash pages slash TSS, loopjewelry.com slash pages slash TSS. A link will be in the show notes. The link will definitely be in the show notes in case you can't remember it. Um, then Loop will know that we that we sent you, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then also, um, if you spend $1,000 or more, use the code TSS and you will get $100 off um, of your purchase. Mm-hmm. And worth noting, once again, uh, they work with leading diamond and jewelry manufacturers to bring you top tier rings at around 30% lower than typical diamond retailers. So you've got that. Then you can have even more savings savings by uh, going to the link in the show notes. Which you will put there. I will, I will indeed. I will indeed. Thank you to Loop Jewelry for sponsoring today's show. Mm-hmm. Shall we move on and talk about the game that I didn't see? <laughs> <laughs> not for a lack of mm-hmm. trying. I did not see Portland versus Dallas. I've only seen the goals. So this game is going to be me asking you a lot of questions. Uh, and I probably won't have many answers because I watched this game while... I mean, I, I watched the game, but I definitely didn't take nearly as many notes. And I think a big part of that is because it was... Definitely the ugliest game of the Ooh. four playoff games. Why so? Because, uh, first of all, it's play- it was like... Like in a facial way? Is that what yes, you- exactly. Everybody was very <laughs> ugly, except for Diego Valeri, who is uh, mild- wildly handsome. Not mildly handsome, wildly handsome. Uh, it was, first of all, it didn't help aesthetically that it was a half-empty stadium. Mm. Not a great look. So, too, was uh, Yankee Stadium for the NYCFC yep. game. So, to be fair, yep. I think it's because it's Halloween, right? It's mm-hmm. arranged at short notice, and it's the evening of Halloween, which is, my experience in the United States is it's a big day for families, right? Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. people have plans. People, I mean, I didn't play an ice hockey game on Halloween because mm-hmm. um, I had plans. So same, same to here. suddenly have a playoff game that's only announced, what, after decision day, so you only mm-hmm. have three days' notice, clashes with Halloween, people can't make it. No. Yeah. It's also the case, isn't Frisco like a suburb of Dallas? Yes, it's not downtown Dallas. It is not downtown yeah. Dallas, and I believe suburbs is where you go to get that good, good candy. So, <laughs> so maybe people it, were in the suburbs doing their trick-or-treating yeah. and not attending an FC Dallas game. I just had a marketing idea. Hmm. I don't know if Dallas did this, but what they should have done is sold trick-or-treat packages and maybe had along the concourse, like yeah. various stops where you could set up and give out candy. This is brilliant. Daryl, g- get your marketing degree. Let's do some things. For hire. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that didn't help. I think the field condition was not very good. Uh, so it was a lot of slipping. It was a lot of sort of like like not very pretty passing moves. And mm-hmm. then I think Portland set up to be ugly and defensive and frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And they did just that. They got bodies behind the ball. They played a very pragmatic style of soccer, which is what they needed to do going on the road. They sat back. They bunkered. They counterattacked when the situation was on and when it was they got some goals, but it did not lead to an aesthetically pleasing game. I also think a big part of that was you look at some of the players that FC Dallas, the uh, Extra Time Radio crew did a great job of pointing this out, that Mauro Diaz of years past, no Mm -hmm. longer there. Kellen Acosta sold in the middle of the season. So you're missing two very strong central midfield players, central midfield presidents. Max Ruti tried to do... (laughs) Yes, presence and presidents. Yes. Um, (laughs) But also the case, Max Ruti dropping in, trying to do a little bit of that role, a little bit of that uh, creative midfield role. Yeah, but he exactly. He's more of a VP, a very professional goal scorer, um, but maybe not so much of like the link up creative player. And so I think when you miss those those types of talents playing against a bunkered team who are happy to sit back and frustrate, it makes it really difficult to break them down. And I think that's exactly what FC Dallas found out. Am I understanding that this is the Portland Timber style now, mm-hmm. right? You sort of um, defensive, don't let anything through, and then we rely on some magic from Diego Valeri, and they got that magic with the with the free kick. Yes, I was going to say some magic from Diego. Diego Valeri, and then whatever the opposite of magic is from FC Dallas for the second year, for the second goal, <laughs> which was Jesse uh, Jesse Gonzalez coming out, but maybe not really communicating very well. Yeah. And again, it was the kind of sloppiness of the game translated into that sequence where nobody controls it. It ends up spilling to Diego Valeri, and he calmly uh, side foots it for the second. Can we give credit to Jeremy Abobase uh, yeah, for absolutely. his role in that second goal, which mm-hmm. turns out to be the winner? It was 2-0 yep. at the time. I mean, it's a it's a good run through, right? Then he, he holds it up really well as Gonzalez comes charging out and doesn't panic when he gets surrounded. He holds it, turns, finds Valeri, yep. uh, slides it in. Did mm-hmm. we have a scouting report on Ibobase? Uh We did, yes. Uh, it, it was basically saying that he has kind of gone from not playing regularly, maybe getting minutes with the USL side, to starting to get consistent minutes. Uh, basically, since September, he has been a consistent starter. Uh, every single game, at least, he's gotten some minutes, and he's also been contributing goals, which is a big step up. Who's- Thank you to David uh, Kishpaw for that one. There we go. So there's a happy play your kid story. Yeah, right? exactly. And now Jeremy Obobese is in the, I want to say, conference semifinal? That sounds right. Yeah, yes. there we go. Mm-hmm. Western yes. Conference semifinal. But this, yes. But this one, again. Also known as the Cascadia final. I, I will let you have as many <laughs> AKAs as you want. Um, <laughs> but this game was also a good reminder, as were several others, the importance of smart uh, aware playmakers, specifically of like uh, Argentine nationality, because <laughs> uh, we already talked about Morales for mm-hmm. NYCFC for. Portland, it's not just that Valeri, like it's not a coincidence that Valeri kept popping up in these moments. If you watch him, his movement is so good. Bobby Warshaw did a whole uh, thing about this one, again, for MLS, that he's just he just has these little three-yard moves and five-yard moves that pull defenders out of position that open up space for other players. And yeah. because he's that sort of big personality for Portland, people kind of gravitate towards him, specifically defenders, and that leaves opportunities for other Portland players. Oh, yeah. He deviates from the plan. He sure does. Yeah. That was a put on his Twitter name. Uh- Oh, you got it. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. (laughs) Um, Anything else on that game? I have nothing else to offer because I uh, did not see it. No, I mean, other than that, it's definitely not the season that FC Dallas, or the end of season that FC Dallas would have expected, given Mm -hmm. that there was a a good chunk of time when they were challenging for the Supporter Shield to end up here, knocked out in the first round. Definitely Uh. not what the... what, maybe 75 fans would have expected? Ooh. I'm just saying. It was more than that. I'm just saying. It was. It definitely was. Uh, they need but, to have trick or treat playoff night. Exactly, trick or treat do. playoff night would have yeah. done, would have done the job. And maybe some sort of uh, shuttle service that goes out there. And maybe also don't sell your creative midfielders <laughs> and your uh, role playing central midfielders. Just a thought. Just should a we, thought. Should we move on to the only game of this round that featured? 
two Argentinian playmakers yeah. going up against each other. It was Federico Higuain mm-hmm. um, versus Luciano Acosta in DC United. I've got this wrong way around, but mm-hmm. DC United because they're at home versus the Columbus crew. To me, this was the best game, yep. uh, the most enjoyable game. Uh, 2-2, uh, then uh, Columbus win on penalty kicks. Yep. Lots to talk about, mm-hmm. but we both tuned into this one with one eye on one of the coaches. We did. It took me a while, I have to say, because I am, like, I am, I always say nominally a DC United fan, which is to say I haven't loved them when they went, like, three wins on a season. <laughs> um, but I definitely have been getting back, like, very much into DC. We saw them uh, in person. I've watched a few of their games just for funsies. Uh, so it was the first 10 or 15 minutes of this game. I was definitely aware that Columbus were on the field. Daryl's still laughing at funsies. I was, I was drinking water, so uh-huh. I couldn't laugh. It I was almost whole, made you do a spit yeah, take onto I, the uh, mixing board. You did, yeah. Yeah, but I'm very professional, so I did not. Yeah, might have shorted because out. Because electricity. And then we would have lost 25 minutes of gold. <laughs> um, but it, it was the case that like I had to remind myself, like, oh, right, there's another team. Because I was just I looking see. at like what Columbus were doing to sort of stop DC. And then as soon as they got the ball back, there was that fan perspective of, okay, how did DC win it back? And yeah, not yeah. so much what are Columbus doing to retain it. Once I made myself, myself stop doing that and instead pay attention to Columbus – it quickly became apparent that Greg Berhalter is a good coach. Okay, yeah. so we have it's really mm-hmm. the narrative has really changed, right? Because yep. it was Columbus nearly missed out on the playoffs altogether, yep. and it would have been this weird, weird moment mm-hmm. to appoint Greg Berhalter as the U.S. Men's National Team. Also, we don't know for sure that he's going to be appointed, um, mm. but it seems after watching this game and thinking about what he accomplished, um, that that yeah, we can be more positive about a Greg Berhalter U.S. Men's National Team. And I guess my question for you mm-hmm. is. Why is that so and what did he do? Sure. I think, again, this is similar to what I was talking about with New York uh, in, their, in their game against, we just talked about a Philly. Like, once you reach the playoffs, I think it allows you time. Maybe not time, but you are really focused on that next opponent. It's yeah. not, oh, we've got this team three games from now and we've got to make sure everybody's fit for that one. Yeah. And because of that, I think you can game plan so much more than you can in the regular season. And I genuinely think this is the first time that a uh, an MLS coach has had the time to really game plan out, out how to deal with Acosta and Rooney yeah. and the best possible way to drill his team such that they effectively nullify what has been a very uh, problematic partnership yep. for the opposition. And I think they did just that. Yep. So it's not just save their penalty kicks. Nope. Because more about that later. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about, um, I think, didn't Behelter talk about disconnecting yep. Rooney and Acosta? He did. Easy to say, not so easy to do. How do you do that? Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you do that? Uh, I think in a few different ways. Uh, I think he really, basically, I think he frustrated them. I think mm-hmm. that was a big thing. I saw you. Well, he I had think, Columbus Crew frustrate them. Well, yeah. Well, uh, he did actually well, frustrate Acosta yeah, that one. He sure did. Well, he sure did. But I think you could see it. Even in the first half, Rooney held it together until the second half. There's one where Rooney gets called for a foul because somebody cleared the ball and their follow through hit Rooney, uh, and the foul gets and that's when he blew up. Mm -hmm. But that moment right there is like the 60th minute or so. I have it in my notes. Yeah, Um, that was when I was like, "Ooh, this game plan is working." Because Acosta got very visibly frustrated multiple times in the first half. Once Rooney started getting to that point too, it felt like that's what they were trying to do. Columbus is have them not focus on how do we combine around the top of the box and find space. The one time they did that was the time that Acosta uh, had the shot yeah. tipped over at the very end of the game. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, there wasn't much between the two because I think they marked Acosta so consistently and physically, worth noting, yep. lots of fouls in this one, that I think you saw Acosta start to get really mad. And I think when he gets mad, he wants more of the ball. But if you're not getting the ball in that attacking position, he then started to drop deep time and time again. Yeah. I saw him at left back and right back just yeah. coming back to get a touch of the ball and try and make something mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. But it was that age-old dilemma then of when he drops in to try to make something happen you would see him demand the ball off of the left back uh yeah he would turn and then look to where he had just been standing but now nobody was sta- mm-hmm. standing because he had moved back and if we're talking about disconnecting rooney and acosta mm-hmm. rooney is the number nine right yeah. so he is literally up front mm-hmm. and the farther deep or wide that lucian acosta has to go to get the ball mm-hmm. the farther apart they are you've yeah. broken the connection because then they can't get around each other and get little quick one twos going because they're like 60 yards apart yeah right? exactly the only way they could have been connected is if they played on yankee stadium <laughs> 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 but i think i want to i want to talk about the um what what uh Bell Alters Columbus crew did in terms of shape sure. to make it so that um, it's, it's not just the marking of Acosta, right? It's well, the fact that he had no space to play in. And I'm interested in how Berhalter achieved that. Well, if, if you'll forgive me, I want to talk a little bit about the marking for a second, just to f- like finish that point out, because 
I think of it like this. Like if you think of when you're doing like the like Mortal Kombat fighting game and your health bar goes down the more you get hit. <laughs> yeah. I think of that with like patience in a game. And if you get a, a big tackle and the foul is given and there's a card given, your patience bar stays up. But as soon as you get a big tackle that you think was a bad challenge and there's no card given or there's no foul even given, that patience bar starts to dip down. And I think if you can do little things along the way, including those big tackles, but a jersey pull here, a shove there, just a little bit of like after the ball is gone, maybe a little bit of a teeny kick, yeah. that patience bar dips down and it's really, it gets to the point where even just a little touch, you would see Acosta get like a little shove and just turn around and complain to the ref and yeah. stop playing. Playing. And I think that really, really worked at keeping him out of the mindset of, no, I got to stay focused. I got to yeah. find that connection. And so it became about him trying to make things happen on his own. And it wasn't like big, nasty tackles, right? It wasn't anything like... a couple like, of those, but, but yeah. It, but it wasn't like consistently super no. obvious. Um, I actually think of when the US played... I want to say Honduras mm-hmm. um, away, and they really just cleaned out Christian oh, yeah. Pulisic mm-hmm. several times um, on the wing. Like, yeah, it wasn't all, like that. Those were all horrible tackles. Yep. This was more, it was smaller, mm-hmm. right? It was smaller uh, little fouls yeah. that just, yeah, just just chipped away at his patience bar as opposed to trying to chop it in half. Yeah, exactly. And so with that <laughs> said- It wasn't a said, Ben Sweat slide tackle. It was not. <laughs> We would have remembered, <laughs> and Acosta's legs would have shown the uh, the punishment. <laughs> um, so, to your point about uh, positioning, one yes. thing that I spotted because I think this is frustrating for Acosta as well, mm-hmm. right? Even when there's no physical contact with him, if he just doesn't have space to go and play him, mm-hmm. that's the other half of the patience attack. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I think though that if you kind of move or like you basically put him under pressure more consistently, that's a thing that's going to maybe limit how much influence he mm-hmm. can have. But also, removing people to pass to is a big part of it. At halftime, uh, Greg Berhalter talked about how. They basically, they wanted to make DC United run. He just said that. We want to make them run and over and over and over again. We want to tire them out, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think a key part of that was getting uh, Columbus getting their fullbacks forward aggressively and often because DC played that back four, but it was a compact back four. So that's where the first goal comes from is Paul Ariola is too far inside and has to go trying to charge out to get to Justin Miram. And I think trying to close that distance, uh, Ariola not being a natural defender to begin with, I think he's just not really sure how to close that distance and ends up getting burnt by Miram. And that happened time and time again. But because they're narrow, now you can send the fullbacks forward. The only way you can really deal with that if you're DC is to send some of your attacking wide players back to deal with that. So even if you win the ball back, you win it maybe 25 yards from your own goal. You've got a Costa and Rooney standing up top, like, or around midfield. Usually they end up having to drop two. So then you stop losing that kind of stretching uh, like figure for DC United. Everybody's back, and you can't really stretch the field at all. So even if DC win the ball back, they can't really do anything with it. The other thing I think plays into this mm-hmm. is, and I really want to give Bellhalter credit for this, yeah. is that Columbus were able to be narrow and compact yeah. in a 4-4-2, mm-hmm. essentially. They look like Sweden against Italy, mm-hmm. right? You really had a lot of people uh, crowded in the middle and... Yeah. Uh, Iguain and Zardes were always behind the halfway yep. line, right? So you had to play through all of them. Mm-hmm. Then there's nowhere to go, Mm-mm. right? So Acosta just cannot get touches in the middle. If he does, Artur is on him. Yep. Someone else is on him. If he tries to mm-hmm. go wide, then there's just yeah. you've got all these bodies in front of you, right? But then when Columbus got the ball back, they um, expanded, right? Like so, then like mm-hmm. a four can get yeah, forward. Exactly. And the le- I've forgotten the left back's name. Valenzuela. Valenzuela can get forward, and like Merrim goes wide, and they they really yeah. like expand and contract and expand yeah, thank you. and contract. And I think that's the really impressive thing. It, it, it was almost two formations in one. It was a four four two, yeah, uh, tight. Then it was a four two three one expansive yes right that's, I think, thank you that's what i was trying to say with like the the fullbacks getting forward is that you're right the, like columbus would collapse back but as soon as they broke they stretched wide yeah. and it felt like dc routinely didn't have enough numbers wide to deal with that so mm-hmm. columbus were comfortable there when dc finally did get those numbers back then columbus had opportunities in the middle and that doesn't happen mm-hmm. without a team being drilled and disciplined and knowing exactly how to do it and when to do it because even just the mm-hmm. basic thing of holding that 442 some teams can't do that. It takes a yeah. lot of discipline to, for for ten people to all stand in a shape that corresponds. Right? Yeah, it's not as easy as you think. No, it's, it's not. not standing still. It's shuffling left, right, b- uh, backwards, forwards, and it also requires diagonals. <laughs> them too. <laughs> it also requires a leap of faith. I think on the Columbus Crew players' part to believe in Berhalter's system because yeah. the other thing I felt like was consistently a thing that Columbus were okay with was DC having the ball out wide. When DC, I remember specifically like four or five times in the second half Nick DeLeon uh, who came on played right back Mm -hmm. would get forward 
and then kind of look and not want to cross the ball because he's got Rooney and Acosta, oftentimes not even both of them in the box. And even then, are they your most like potent aerial threats? Probably uh-huh. not. I mean, and, Rooney's decent in the air, but it's not what you're going to like no. build your whole game plan. Yeah, on, and right? so, he's not Peter Crouch. And so it felt like, but you didn't. If they hadn't been drilled, if Columbus hadn't really worked on, I think being okay with DC having the ball wide, you might have have had Afol come sprinting out to try to make a play. Maybe he gets beat, or maybe he sprints out. So then Sorrow has to cover. But now there's space in the middle that can be yeah. opened up, and it felt like they were content with nope you can have the ball out there we're not going to put you under too much pressure as soon as you try to come central that's where we're going to step and try to win that ball back I want to tell you about the moment that uh, my thinking about Bear Halter, mm-hmm. my he went up in my estimation yeah. is at half time when he said the thing you mentioned earlier about we want to make them run more I've heard coaches say something like that mm-hmm. and it really just means we want to have them chase and it doesn't you don't actually see it happen mm-hmm. you saw it happen you saw the Columbus crew move the ball around a lot more yep. sort of go from they were really good at like quick short passes going from left to right and left to right but actually working their way down the field as they do it mm-hmm. and then you saw DC players chasing that around and as soon as you like get close to Iguain he moves the ball on as soon as you get get close to the next mm-hmm. guy he moves the ball on and you really saw DC trying to chase down Columbus Columbus moving the ball around yeah he, and, they made them run just like Berhalter said at half time and that and the key thing there for me is that it's them running and reacting to it and that's the big difference is that it felt like there was a game plan for how to deal with Rooney and Acosta and it felt like DC's game plan for dealing with Columbus was just try to get to him as fast as you can mm-hmm. But that really did not work. I had this exchange. I forget who it was with, uh, with, with whom it was on Twitter. I apologize. Um, but it was that, like, Iguain is Columbus's best player and their main attacking threat. Yes, Zardes, fine. But Iguain is the one that you've got to pay attention to. And even then, he kept getting space. Yep. He scores both their goals. But routinely, he would find that little gap. He kept doing a little bit of adjustment to always stay five yards away from that player and six yards away from that mm-hmm. player and seven yards away from that player. Patrick Keeler is who you had that Thank conversation you. with. Thank you. Yes, and yeah. so it, it, it blew my mind that even with DC running a lot and knowing that Iguain was this threat, he always was able to find a little bit of space and just get that ball. And even if he did then come under pressure, it was still, he receives it and he plays it wide, but you still advance the ball 30 yards up the field because you're able to play it into his feet. Yep. And I think that was another difference for me was that if you switch that around, I think Greg Berhalter has a specific plan for how to negate uh, Iguain. Ben Olsen just didn't have that on the night. I agree. And I think the best example of what you're saying is what would have been the winning goal if De Leon hadn't yep. equalized. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes into Iguain, finds a bit of space, and he immediately yep. uh, shifts it out wide. I'm guessing to Harrison Affle. You are correct. Um, who then crosses it mm-hmm. for Iguain to yep. be um, on the end of it. Yeah. yeah. And it's 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 so like easy to just ignore that little ball wide from Iguain because the finish is so well taken and like really well picked out he spots his his chance and takes it but it is that like that ball is played into him and DC are quick to react again they're reacting but it's Iguain kind of off balance just sort of shuffles it across mm-hmm. but that's all it takes yep. to find Take advantage of the reaction yeah and and because that ball is played into Iguain who is behind that first DC United like row of defenders so he's gotten right behind Canaus now DC have to kind of collapse and because they're collapsing they're not really paying attention to their marks anymore they're paying attention to getting into a defense of shape so nobody pays attention to Iguain again that's why he's open to get that return pass and they don't learn it happens again like nine minutes later the exact same sequence and this time it's he plays uh, Iguain plays to Awful and then screams for the ball back and gets it back it takes a first time shot it goes just wide so here's the question mm-hmm. um, if Iguain is so central to everything that the Columbus crew do and he yeah. absolutely is and he's absolutely how do we get him to play for the national team wonderful to watch I mean kind of yes I think a couple of people asked this question mm-hmm. like it's okay to be impressed with what the way that Greg Berhalter has Columbus crew playing mm-hmm. But what if you don't have a Federico Iguain? And famously, the U.S. Mm -hmm. doesn't really have a number 10, right? We've been playing Julian Green as our number 10. Mm -hmm. As much as I would like to give you an answer, my answer would just be uh, your answer to this because I think you answered this correctly before we started recording. So go ahead. What's the answer? Which is that we don't expect that when Greg Berhalter takes the U.S. Mm -hmm. men's national team job, he's not going to copy and paste his Columbus crew tactics. It's about working with what you've got. And if we assume that Greg Berhalter is not a one-trick pony Mm -hmm. who only knows how to do this one setup, and the detail that went into this DC win suggests that he can put detail into any kind of setup that he puts his mind to, um, then you don't you don't have to have an Iguain, right? You have a different plan with different personnel. You work with what you've got. Agreed, 100%. I would say the Is that one... what I said earlier? I really can't remember. Oh, uh, yeah, basically. That it's a, we, you, you shouldn't just expect him to do the exact same thing and then if he doesn't have Iguain, it's like, well, yeah. now we're in trouble. Yeah. I would say this. The other thing that... <laughs> you expect him to be like, oh, I thought I could have any player that played in America. Yeah. Is that not how this works? <laughs> he just misunderstood. Yeah, he's not Rude Hullet. He knows these things. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a deep cut. Um, but... I, 
I am a, a fan of like I don't know it doesn't necessarily translate to the best American soccer but I love the United States having that reputation of they never stop they always keep trying they always mm-hmm. keep running they will never say die and it felt like if there's one thing that maybe would translate from Iguain's performance for the crew I mean that man covered so much ground at such a high speed he was still sprinting in the 121st minute he ends up getting a shot that he hits over from 18 yards out because I think he is completely exhausted at that point mm-hmm. but he is still going and going and going and with that, I would say, U.S. national team players, you better be fit when you go into camp <laughs> if Greg Berhalter, if and when Greg Berhalter is manager, because I bet we're going to see a lot of hard running from the U.S. national team. Well, let's talk about some players who will be eligible sure. for the U.S. Mm-hmm. men's national team. I know one guy that caught your eye playing for D.C. United yep. was Russell Knauss. He sure did. Yeah. I, I think he was D.C.'s best player far and away mm-hmm. on, the, on the evening. Uh, he, I mean, it starts in the 14th minute. He has a 60-yard sprint back to cut out across from Iguain. That was amazing. He did a lot for one thing. I didn't see it happen enough to feel like it was a targeted thing from Columbus, but I did notice that Iguain was always kind of sprinting, but he went to like 101%. I know how much you love those percentages. Uh, he went really hard whenever Briant got the ball, mm-hmm. uh, the other center back for DC, because it felt like he was a little bit shaky. I saw him a couple times just be like, eh, I'm just kicking out of bounds. I don't care when there was a little bit of pressure. Yeah. And it felt like Canals kept having to like make up for Briant. There was one where he cuts out across from Zardes that I think Briant had just given the ball away. And you can see him sort of look back and roll his eyes. And it just felt like he was the man responsible for putting out fires defensively yes. when nobody else could. Here's what I like about his game. Mm-hmm. The reason he's able to put out those fires um, yep. defensively when no one else can. He comes in hot. He really comes in yep. hot, but almost always clean. Yep. And I've, it's quite a rare thing in a number six to, to see that. It's kind of the opposite of the... Uh, Michael Bradley will mm-hmm. trap thing we see when they just sort of do the hop and jockey people. Yep. Kanaz comes flying in, but it's almost never a free kick. It's usually yep. he then comes flying out with mm-hmm. the ball and then quickly moves the ball on and passes it to someone else. I don't think I've ever seen a player it's an impressive skill. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a player like have so many ball recoveries or maintain possession via slide tackles. That there would be like a, <laughs> a loose pass that was a 50-50 ball and he would slide in, but in the slide would pass it on to Rooney and then Rooney would turn. Yeah. That was really impressive. The other thing that I found consistently really enjoyable to watch is how much Russell Knauss appears to have watched Paul Pogba and has learned how you use your body in a physical challenge. Mm-hmm. Because He is not as tall as Paul Pogba. He is definitely not as tall as Paul Pogba. <laughs> But what I do think he has done is recognize that maybe under pressure, this is just me speculating, but I feel like he knows under pressure, his first touch isn't as good as it needs to be to bring the ball down under pressure in the middle of middle of the field as that defensive midfielder. So what he does do, I saw him do this like three or four times, is there's a 50-50 ball, he sees the opponent coming, he just steps into that opponent. And it's not illegal, it's not like he's just bodying that player off, but instead of letting it be a 50-50, he maybe changes it into a 60-40 because he just takes a little shuffle to the left, yep. now that player has to run into him to try to get the ball as opposed to it being they're both running at it. Well, that's about just taking position, right? You know where the ball's going to be, so you make sure that you are in the best possible position. But I feel like he did that at the expense of getting a first touch. It wasn't like he was doing that and then focusing on the touch. It was 100% I'm bodying that person off, then I will take the ball. But it wasn't I'm going to do both at the same time. It was sort of one and then the other. And I'm okay with that because if you can get away with it, which he did pretty routinely, then it it suits what you're trying to do. If he plays for the U.S. national team, Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any concerns, like any downsides yep. to his game? Yeah, certainly. Okay, what, what are they? I mean, I, I did not see him look uh, forward very often. Mm-hmm. It felt like he was far more comfortable playing back to the center backs or playing wide to one of the fullbacks than he was I can see that turning and playing the ball through. Yeah. And it did feel like that was maybe part of the reason why we saw Acosta dropping in so much because he wasn't getting that ball into feet and then able to turn and go at people. I noticed in that, that Columbus 4-4-2 we talked about, the guy that often was open, was Russell Canas, right? He would be like equidistant between mm-hmm. uh, Zardes and Iguain and just behind them. So yeah. he was available for a pass mm-hmm. from Birnbaum or Briant and he would receive it sometimes, but then he could not break open the, he could not make the next pass. No. And it's tough, right? Because mm-hmm. Columbus have got all those numbers. You've got two banks of four then mm-hmm. that you're facing. But I don't think I ever saw him like break the lines, no. um, to use the classic phrase. Yeah, I would agree with just that. Just fine. That's just not his game, I guess. Yeah, it's not. But then continuing with the Burhalter thought experiments, mm-hmm. like 
uh, going back to your point about it, like how he's going to make the most with what he has, say he does have Russell Knauss and he thinks, okay, he can be a really good ball winning number six. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put somebody like with him in a four two three one who is a very good ball playing midfielder, and then yeah. Knauss can win it. He can play it to Weston McKinney who can split two people, and then we'll go that way. Yeah, or right. Kellen Acosta who can split two people. I like this plan. Or Christian Roldan before we hear any tweets. <laughs> well, we'll talk a lot about Seattle when we see them in the uh, the Western Conference semi final mm-hmm. uh, again against Portland. Yeah, another player who uh, caught my eye, not surprisingly, was Zach Steffen. Yes, let's talk um, about it. Stood tall in the penalties, uh, two big saves, uh, and I think I'm going to say he even has not a literal hand in the uh, the miss from Nick De Leon. But if you watch that one again, De Leon is staring at Zach Steffen, and Zach Steffen just stares right back and looks. Not nonplussed because nonplussed doesn't mean what we think it means. Uh, he he looks just very calm, yeah. and I think Nick DeLeon is kind of trying to do that. Like I'm going to stare you down and do what I want. Yeah. And when the other person kind of goes right back at you, you can sort of see Nick DeLeon shoulders go down a little <laughs> bit. He looks a little bit less confident. He visibly shrinks. And I all, and I think it makes him think. And as soon I genuinely think he was going to his right hands, his right side, Stefan's left. Yeah. And that stare down I think gets in his head and he adjusts mm-hmm. and he doesn't hit it well and he skies that shot. But I think it's because mid run up he decides I'm going to go left instead of right and that's yep. what happens. There's also, um, I like what Stefan was doing on mm-hmm. the penalties with the, um, like, yep. Stepping one way, then going the other, or stepping one way, then going that mm-hmm. way. He was doing a thing where I think we've talked about this before where successful penalty saving goalkeepers, mm-hmm. um, they don't wait for the striker and then react. Because what a good striker is doing, or a good penalty kick taker is doing, is they're waiting for you to react and then they can react and go the other way. Stefan is flipping the script and taking control of the situation where if he faints left, yep. then the taker has to decide, oh, do I kick it to his right or is he faking me out by stepping left and then springing right which yeah. is what he did um, at least once I can't remember if it was the Rooney save or the um, Acosta save yeah those but were not well hit either <laughs> right but but he's making the penalty taker reactive mm-hmm. whereas normally what the penalty taker wants true. is for the goalkeeper to be reactive so yep. he's flipped it upside down here's what's doubly impressive about Zach Steffen this goes back to my uh, the interview I had with Tim Howard mm-hmm. do you remember when I asked Tim Howard about like what I asked him about Zach Steffen being the number yep. one and he told me no it's Bregazan yep. <laughs> but because I tried to be a pro, I pushed him a little more. And he said, we won't really know how good Zach Steffen is until you see things where he has an error Mm -hmm. and whether that breaks him or whether he comes back stronger. And that was ringing in my head watching those penalty kicks, Mm -hmm. realizing that uh, the first goal that DC score is an absolute howler from Zach Steffen. Yes. Right? And here is where, like, I take your point, but I will say this, and I'm sure, like, people won't love this. Steffen was great in the penalties. He did not do a lot to make me think, yep, he is definitely the number one. If Mm -hmm. anything, I felt like he kind of, like he and Bill Hamid are still right there with me as well as Brad Guzan in contention because I saw the same issues for both of them. I saw Stefan have some great saves and some great positioning. Bill Hamid pulls out that amazing save. Maybe the ball is going wide at the very end, but still it's a full stretch save to tip the ball past the post. But both Stefan and Hamid really struggled in commanding the box. That mm-hmm. first goal comes from Stefan spilling a maybe cross, maybe shot from Acosta that he easily should have saved. But he's another one of the second half where it's a free kick in from Rooney that he comes out to punch and just swats at and misses completely. Hamid did the same thing. Both of them don't have that command that it seems like Brad Guzan has in the box. Yeah. So while I really enjoyed a lot of what I saw from Stefan, and you're right, he didn't fold when that first goal happened. Yeah. And my, my point being that if you have that yeah. mistake, because he really does, like, mm-hmm. he should have caught that cross, he fluffs it, then yeah. Brad able to, to come and to come and True. score it. Mm-hmm. There were goalkeepers that could absolutely fall apart. After You're absolutely that. right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And so I think maybe that is a positive that I didn't have uh, before we had this conversation. But I, I was I'm glad s- I could brighten your day. You could because I was kind <laughs> of sad by that mistake because it still left me with concerns about Stefan moving into the later rounds of the playoffs, but also uh-huh. appearing for the U.S. national team as well. Maybe in the offseason he works on, I don't know, coming out and yelling at people who are in the general vicinity of him. That's what I want. (laughs) Just yell at strangers who walk too close. Anything else on this game before we move on? We have another game to go and the US under 20. Very quickly, yeah, I would just add, uh, I also paid attention to Jassy Zardes because if it is Berhalter, I feel like maybe we see a little bit more of Zardes with the national team. And I feel like Zardes had a Zardes game, which is mean? to say he was exciting at times to watch him dribbling at that DC defense. And there were a few moments when I was like, oh, they do not know what to do with him in terms of do we tackle, do we back off? So he had them a little bit nervous. Be- I kn- before you know a negative, he yeah. was also very good in the defensive 4-4-2 shape. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah totally. Uh, I wasn't actually going to do a negative. I was going to say oh. I also saw him a, a role that seemed to be uniquely his was if Columbus had a throw in anywhere within like 30 yards of DC's goal line. 
it felt like it always went into Zardes, who always had at least one, usually two players around him. And he pretty regularly did a good job of bringing that ball down, keeping it under control. A couple times he gave away a throw-in, but even then he's giving a throw-in 15, 20 yards down the field. A lot of other times with that pressure, he's still able to bring it down, play it back, and keep the ball moving. So I thought that was all good. The only thing I didn't really love, aside from him missing the penalty, which I felt was telegraphed by how not confident he looked, was that the De Leon equalizer comes from an incredibly weak header from Jossie Zardes. He basically is the one who could have maybe put a little bit more mustard on it to get it headed clear or could have chested it and volleyed it out. I understand it's the dying moments. I understand there's pressure, but that's when you've got to have that next level awareness if you're going to be a national team caliber player. Mm -hmm. For him to head it basically right to De Leon to volley, it's why De Leon is able to basically not move and instead just hit it from a standing position. That's why. My my memory of that is I think Zardes is trying to nod it ahead of himself and then get to it again. And Mm -hmm. maybe, obviously, if he could have that moment again, uh, yeah. Maybe he'd do it all the same because they end up winning. Yeah. But um, if, to not concede that goal, it could have just been like, head it out wide. Or yeah. just, just get rid, get rid. Uh, yeah, again, yeah. that's the pressurized decision making mm-hmm. that we don't love. So maybe we see him continue to work on that one yeah. too. Yeah. Um, although he did be- he did at least as well as certain centre backs we'll be talking about um, in, the, this is true. in the final game. Any final words on Columbus's win over DC United? No, I mean, I'll say this. While, while I was definitely rooting for DC in this one, I love the narrative that's happening right now and I really hope Columbus go very far because I love the idea of Columbus uh, saved the crew mm-hmm. and then making Which that run. still not official by the way. We yeah. still, that, ne- that deal needs to be officially put together. It does. Just saying. But if if either or both of the New York teams doesn't make it out, I guess really they'll be happy with Atlanta but I can't imagine that MLS has been loving some of the results. They definitely did not love the Galaxy not making the playoffs. Yeah. They cannot have loved DC being eliminated by the crew. That does... Like Don Garber, because oh, you lose Rooney and Acosta. Don Garber does not want to hand any silverware to the crew. I'll, I'll say that much. And then I think with the upcoming game, they did not love that LAFC were also eliminated. Yeah. So I think they're really hoping that New York or Atlanta do some things. <laughs> Actually, probably just New York because I don't know if Atlanta. Oh, I don't know if they're going to. I mean, they're Major big Soccer. business, but I don't know if they're going to be. I guess neutrals will watch Atlanta because they're that exciting. So yeah, Atlanta, New York. As long as they make the final, I guess MLS will be happy. Yeah, I mean MLS will be happy no matter what. Meh. Okay. <laughs> Today's show is also sponsored by LinkedIn. God, I want Don Garber to have to Link- hand stuff to, <laughs> to the crew. I know everybody listening knows what LinkedIn is or thinks they know uh, what LinkedIn mm-hmm. is. Uh, but did you know it's also the best place to post a job? Post a job to LinkedIn and find the right candidate. I genuinely did not know that, but I know it now. You didn't know you could do that? Because I've read the copy. <laughs> <laughs> So the advantages um, of posting mm-hmm. a job to to LinkedIn um, is that you're going to find people who sort of didn't know they were looking for jobs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You get those people who are maybe on one of those other job websites because they're sort of uh, – maybe they're not as employable yeah. <laughs> as certain other people. Whereas professionals are on LinkedIn will just see that you've posted the job mm-hmm. and you can end up getting uh, the right person that maybe didn't even know you were looking for them. Yeah. I mean not speaking for you and me because this is a pretty perfect job. I'm not going to lie. But I think there's always other jobs out there. And I mm-hmm. think even if you have a job that you like, you might be on LinkedIn and see, oh, it's a similar position, but it pays five grand more. Yeah. Maybe that's the one I want. <laughs> and I think you're always going to have that movement. So if, for example, there's a team in the Midwest mm-hmm. and they lose their coach because he takes a national position. Mm-hmm. I'm saying if Greg Bahalter leaves. Yeah, I, I was with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you were Col- not speaking a language of subtlety. <laughs> Columbus Crew could uh, yeah. post the uh, head coach's job um, mm-hmm. onto LinkedIn. Yeah. If they did that, Taylor, who do you think they would be hoping to get? I mean, uh, let's just get uh, let's just get Klinsman in there. Why not? Oh, no. <laughs> we didn't save the crew for that to happen. No, I, I think one – I. Maybe this is, would be unpopular, but I feel like given the relationship to Akron, maybe you get Caleb Porter in for the crew. Ooh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was rumored as the Cincinnati coach. But oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. But yeah, different Ohio team. I think Caleb Porter would be a good fit there. I think he yeah. would too. I think he um, would too. Which are, which are the um, teams that we know about are I mean, looking for coaches right I now? I would love Real Madrid to yes. put their managerial vacancy on LinkedIn and see who applies. They who, were, do you, who do you think would or should apply? Last I saw, they were they were in, they had like reached out to representatives for uh, Leonardo Jardim, or Hardim, the former Monaco manager who yeah. has just been fired for being not very good. They can do better than that. Well, I don't. I mean, maybe. That's why I want to see them put it out there because I want to see people like Sam Allardyce apply for the Real Madrid <laughs> job. He's always said that he should have it. Yeah. You know who might be? So Zinedine Zidane might be just clicking around, mm-hmm. sees it posted by Real Madrid, and he's like, oh, you know what? That was good. Let's, let's go back there. He sees, he sees a posting from Madrid. He sees a posting from Manchester United. He's like, 
Uh, maybe Madrid doesn't look so bad. <laughs> maybe it doesn't look so bad. So right. He'd be an example of someone who maybe wasn't looking for a job. There you go. But, uh, there you go. See, but sees one. Maybe, maybe Mauricio Pochettino didn't know he was looking for a job, but then like has a particularly bad day at the office, is feeling a little bit frustrated, and mm-hmm. then happens to see that vacancy. Yep. Maybe he jumps at that opportunity. And maybe in the job posting it says, we won't put NFL stuff on the field. That could be, that could, that could be a bonus <laughs> as well. Nor will we... Allow our players to play on an NFL surface in the regular season. Uh, That's another part of uh, Madrid's posting. So if you want to grow your business, Mm -hmm. um, um, post a job to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. A new hire is made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn, according to my copy points here. So um, I believe it. Mm -hmm. Um, If you go to LinkedIn.com slash TSS, LinkedIn.com slash TSS, you get $50 discount on your first job post. So LinkedIn.com slash TSS, you get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions do apply, but thank you to LinkedIn for sponsoring today's uh, MLS playoff recap show with a little U20s thrown in there. Yeah, a sprinkle we've got, of U20s. We've got one more game to get to. It was the final game. It was somewhat the most dramatic, uh, if not yeah. the finish then from all the other stuff that happened on the field. So here's my subjective experience of this game mm-hmm. is it was a 10.30 Eastern yep. kickoff and I hadn't had that much sleep the night before all right. and I was emotionally exhausted mm-hmm. by DC yeah. versus Columbus. So I feel like maybe this game was actually more entertaining than than the amount that I enjoyed it because of my physical condition. I agree with is that you. Fair? Yeah, I, I had a harder time getting into this one and staying into this one and like recognizing patterns of play. Yeah. In the end, it felt slightly more disjointed, and I think that's because RSL got the lead and then re got the lead, mm-hmm. and then I think LAFC were desperate, and thus I think it led to a little bit more of desperation sequences as opposed to consistent patterns of play. Yep. Actually, that sounds about right to me because I brewed some coffee this morning, right. went back and rewatched some good chunks to get, mm-hmm. a, to get a proper feel for it. Um, if you don't know the score, it finished 3-2 to Rail Salt Lake at LAFC, yeah. which is a, a big, big result. I guess the big talking point, the highlight of this game is the Krylak goal, mm-hmm. the Krylak karate kick Absolutely. goal, um, which I believe was the equalizer, right? It's yep. made it 2-2. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess I, guess I, wanted, I want to talk through this first because I right. think it'll be the main thing that people know about this goal. Okay. So um, what do you want to talk about specifically? Um, I think I actually want to talk about just what a weird technique it is. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask the question, not how do you do that? Why do you do that? Yeah. Why would someone pull off this sort of scissor kick karate kick type thing as opposed to just hitting it like like a normal volley i think it was uh taylor twelman who talked about this a little bit so credit where credit is yeah. i think too but it's it's uh is the it idea num- number one in brackets that, yes what, yeah. uh it's it's <laughs> how you build up momentum if you're in a static position and this ball yes. spills to Krylock, and he is sort of more or less standing and so if he just tried to hit that it would require a little bit more of like a run up to hit that volley. Oh, he doesn't, really, have, he doesn't have a run up. It's really yeah. hard without the momentum to just hit a plant foot volley without really like being able to follow through essentially because you have no momentum. Mm-hmm. But that sort of he almost I know this is a strange way to put it, but it's like a reverse bicycle kick. Yes. Like think about the mechanics you have to do to get yourself in the position to hit a bicycle kick with power. That's essentially what he does. He mm-hmm. builds up that momentum with the I just did it under the desk if you could hear by the change in my tone. Uh, builds pulled, up the momentum my feet in just to, my hit, to hit that volley with the amount of power he hits it with. Yeah. Um, I also want to talk about the assist for this goal, <laughs> which comes from <laughs> LAFC defender <laughs> Silva. Yeah. Um, this was some very unimpressive defending. This is kind of what I was alluding to with the Zardes. Which head time? Head. <laughs> oh, so um, I actually can't remember how uh, the cross comes in. Oh, no, it's after Baird brings it down and mm-hmm. uh, squares it, has a go. The ball pops up, and Silva has the chance to bang this ball clear, yep. right? He since has, there were two Silvas, Danilo Silva. Danilo Silva. He has time to like do, hit this ball pretty much however he yep. wants it. He goes um, what we call in-step, yep. which is side of the foot, and just pops it up to the, to the top of the box where Krylak is waiting. Yep. And and this I would say is maybe even worse than Jassy Zardes is because even though like Zardes, is, Zardes gives it forward momentum and chases it. Yeah, but it's also <laughs> the case that like this didn't need to be hit the way Danilo Silva hits it. It's not like he was scrambling and just barely got a foot to it. Mm-hmm. Like he was he was planted. He swings through. He just doesn't put power behind it. And I'm not sure if that was because he didn't want to just hoof it long and give up possession, or if he was trying to like maybe just lift it over the top and then start a counterattack or something. But either way, he basically just plays it right to an RSL player to hit right back at him. 
it goes back to it, I always reference this your old joke about uh, Dejan Stankovic and like he hits the volley off of the goal kick and it's oh. just that's very much the attacker saying no yeah it's like to punish him for yes, some exactly. st- <laughs> stupid play it, the only way this was a good set, a, a good uh, mm-hmm. ball is if you're playing um, in England we call it heads and volleys I believe here I've played it with you one touch it's called one touch where you, basically you have to score on a volley yep. or a header and you only right? have one touch and you only have one touch um, it look when you set someone up to have mm-hmm. a go that's normally what it looks like right yep. is you just loft it to them just like Silver did for Krylak. Yep. I want Silver to have the official assist for this. That's how Maybe bad I think it there, is. There is a weird <laughs> like tactical element of if you want to make somebody go in the goal because if you, I think, get a certain number of goals scored on you, at least in the one-touch version, then you get butts up. Yeah. So you can sort of tempt a player into like trying to hit a bicycle by lofting that ball for them. Yeah. Maybe that's what uh, Daniel Silva is doing. He's just like, you're not going to be able to do this here. I'll give you the chance. You're going to sky it over. It's going to break all your momentum and then we'll score. And then you'll have to go and goal for... Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's how it works. You didn't know that? That's <laughs> That is a weird pattern of MLS. Nobody knew that one. Speaking of guys who are in goal for us, well, before we do that one, I just wanted to say really quickly, Danilo Silva also is the one who misjudges the cross from Brooks Lennon for the first goal. Yes. I don't know what he's doing there, but it's a really weird game from him. because it's for he, first goal, right? Yeah, uh, yeah he com- Danilo Silva completely misreads this cross, so then Krylock is able to chest it, settle it, and score from 12 yards out with no pressure. Mm-hmm. Then Danilo Silva scores the equalizer for LAFC, then he gives up the equalizer for RSL. It's a very strange game for him. I'm glad you mentioned Brooks Lennon's cross yeah. for the first Krylark goal. Brooks mm-hmm. Lennon does really well with like an underlapping yep. run, then gets to the end line. I don't think he looks up, but he must. He has a mental picture in his head or mm-hmm. he knows roughly which spot to hit. It's a really good cross in the end yeah. to find Krylark. But I also want to note, because there's so much focus on the karate kick mm-hmm. um, aspect of Krylark's goal, the builder to that goal is all about 21-year-old American uh, striker turned right winger turned right back, mm-hmm. Brooks Lennon, who, one, surprises Carlos Vela, who's waiting to receive a pass. Lennon steps. Yep. Two, drives down the field like he's Paul Pogba, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, dribbles straight down the middle of the field, goes past Benny Fireharbour. Three, I think, plays, uh, lays the ball off, um, going for a one-two. The mm-hmm. ball ends up going out wide. Then there's a scramble in the box. Then it pops up for yep. the Krylock karate kick. So it's Brooks Lennon heavily involved in two of Real Salt Lake's goals. Yeah, it, I feel like he, at a certain point in, New in the game... New Yeah, perfect. Um, maybe slightly older Reggie Cannon? I think he... I enjoyed that Brooks Lennon has a moment where he just like is like, oh yeah, I'm an attacker. Right, I can still be an attacker. And then he kind of switches that part of the brain on mm-hmm. and then has the confidence to go at people. It's the extra yeah. boost he needs. But he, uh, he was the um, the... What's the word? Um, the flip side of the mm-hmm. McKenzie Trusty experience yep. of watching them essentially get beat up in the playoffs by Vera Morales. Mm-hmm. We saw Brooks Lennon, I think, really perform, especially as an attacking right back yeah. um, in a game where his team was the underdog and away from home. I would agree with yeah. that. And so in a game where he uh, had, was very involved in both goals and a game where Krylock scores two that were both very, very well taken goals. Strangely, I feel like the like enduring moment of this game or the doing, enduring image, which I think you were about to get to previously, is Nick Romando and everything that happened with him. Yes. So if you're one of those LAFC fans that mm-hmm. was throwing beer and other stuff on the field, basically at Nick Romando, boo. Then, then boo. I yeah. boo you. I shame boo you aggressively. You. Yeah. yeah. And also if you're one of those fans who was chanting that word, then yeah. also boo, shame on you. I coached four-year-olds today. Do you know what I had to tell one of my four-year-olds? Don't, th- don't throw stuff. We don't throw things at friends. Yeah. Come on, guys. Uh-huh. Don't throw things. That's not all right. Oh, I mean, credit to Nick Aranda for having a good sense of humor about it this morning mm-hmm. when he was uh, posting on Twitter. But um, you should not do that to a goalkeeper. I also think it's somewhat, um, at least partly the reason why Silva, Dino Silva, was able to score that equalizer. Yeah. He was just after Romando got hit by a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, and after the goal, a bunch of stuff got thrown on the field. Referee Mark Geiger, mm-hmm. I believe, called the players off after yeah. that. Yeah. Like, l- like, I think literally, what, like 15, 20 seconds after that? Yeah. yeah. It also wasn't a great look for... I don't know if this is an MLS thing or a stadium thing, but you had the like right wing slash white supremacist uh, in the stands for NYCFC. Yes, there's a lot of coverage Wasn't of he that one. Was supposed to be banned? Or yes, they, they were supposed to. They be were banned? supposed to be. He was there. Same thing. Uh, one of the LAFC fans who like attacked the Galaxy fans, like knocked over the cooler. Do you remember that whole thing? Before oh, vaguely. The, yeah. yeah, he was. I think he got a lifetime ban or at least a season ban. He was definitely in attendance because he had his Twitter handle on the back of his jersey, so he was captured on film. So. Twice, people who shouldn't be there were there, and you have to believe maybe that factors into things like people throwing stuff onto the field. If you've mm-hmm. got a, that kind of rowdy background, it's going to continue to be the case. God, just enjoy football without causing trouble. Yeah, and right? especially because like you forget. Like I know it's, oh, it's ice, or it's a cup, or it's whatever, but first of all, that sucks to have a bunch of stuff thrown at you. But also, if, it's, if it changes to, oh, I threw a thing, I'll throw a quarter next time, or I'll throw a battery, or a cell phone, or whatever, like, 
that's going to cause damage and it's going to be problematic. I honestly think that people see this stuff happening mm-hmm. in other leagues or yeah. historically it's happened in other leagues. and It has like some weird cool element. People yeah. think it's like a thing that soccer fans have to emulate to become real soccer fans yeah. and it's that's the most depressing thing about it to me is it's mimicking the worst part of uh, soccer fandom yeah. also, or one of the worst parts I also don't know the prices in uh, the stadium but like whenever I see people doing that it happened with DC when DC scored their equalizer everybody in the away like in the like the the ultras section or yeah, the yeah. diehard section uh threw their beers in the air and i would just look at that and think like how do you all have that much money <laughs> like, you're just throwing away eight bucks right there or that little sense exactly <laughs> or that but i did enjoy at the very end of the game uh nick romando got far enough away from the goal to then turn and applaud the la fans yes uh, and i enjoyed his tweet today yeah where he was like if, if you're gonna throw a beer at me make sure there's like a cap on it yeah. and i'm paying attention and he listed his favorite beers. yes he did <laughs> um anything else uh, from this game no i think that's that's about it i just it was it was strange because i kind of wanted like i don't know why i do this but i guess i tend to pick a team that i would prefer to see go through and it, it was yourself a rooting interest i guess yeah. so but it was more like lafc it felt like they would be the team that were going to be the more entertaining of the two mm-hmm. like if they went deeper into the playoffs and it, it and that whole situation soured me very quickly because i was like i don't want to reward that behavior i don't want people oh, breaking up games and being jerks and throwing stuff yeah. at nick Romando to make it into the next round where they might do it again you, so you're like i don't care if you play lee win and benny fire but as your deep playing midfield no it's, it's very nice but don't throw stuff because like you pointed out like like uh, the Christian Ramirez goal uh, for LAFC, mm-hmm. that's Lee Wynn playing deep. And we talked about like Russell Knauss isn't playing that ball. Yeah. yeah. Like Lee Wynn is. That would have been really exciting to uh-huh. see. But instead, all I could think was, hey, four-year-olds don't throw stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to Actually, I do want to finish by giving credit to, I guess it's Mike Petke, but mm-hmm. um, especially Kyle Beckerman yeah. and is his name Luke Mulholland, mm-hmm. two defensive midfielders who, apart from that Christian Ramirez goal where Beckerman got tempted to go too far forward they essentially sat in front of their two center backs and did not let anything Mm. come through it was a very stodgy but effective performance it was classic kyle beckerman Mm -hmm. it sure was (laughs) even sans dreads classic kyle beckerman even sans dreads the the only downside to me as a u.s men's national team play your Mm -hmm. kids fan justin glad did not he did play right but he did not start very very end game he seems to be the third choice center back on rail salt lake he sure does yeah it just takes the it takes 10% off of my Brooks Lennon enjoyment. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair for Brooks Lennon. <laughs> Maybe you should help Justin Gladmore. All right, well, if you want to see uh, young Americans doing things, you'll still have some in the playoffs, obviously, but you've also yeah. got the USU 20s to watch. Oh, yeah. So, okay, we're going to talk about the mm-hmm. 7-1 win over Puerto Rico. Uh, sure. I just want to let people know about this weekend's games, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next round of the MS playoffs is the conference, conference semifinals. There you go. I got it. I caught myself. Um, okay, the games are Columbus Crew versus New York, first leg at Columbus. Um, Portland Timbers versus Seattle. New York City FC versus Atlanta. Rail Salt Lake versus Sporting KC. All good games. All I very think. good games. But all played on the same day. So I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. <laughs> it's going to be a long day. It sure is. We have an 11 a.m. game as well. And then I have a 3 p.m. game. Ooh. <laughs> all right. We'll brew some coffee. We'll brew yeah. some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take some Advil. I'll be all right. <laughs> so, yeah, U20s. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in World Cup qualifying. They're going to play five games in the initial group stage. We explained it all on the Tuesday show. They beat Puerto Rico 7 1. Not unexpected. No. Right? We expected a big win. We did. Um, did anything impress you that's really worth uh, highlighting? Yeah, I, I feel like you, you can have those games where the opponent is very clearly weaker. And I do think Puerto Rico come back in what? It was 2-1. to one. I think Puerto Rico pulled yeah. one back that early. Um, but I think it was very obvious from like the fourth goal on that the United three States— three to one. It was 3-1. So three it was 3-0 when they scored, yeah. But, but I felt like you still saw like the U.S. players playing sharp soccer, but n- mm-hmm. then not— uh, Who was it who scored the goal that was just like, yay? Was it— uh, It was Yan- Ulysses Lange. Yeah, Giannis. Yeah. Who like, he didn't really celebrate, and I just enjoyed the enthusiasm of the players with a lot of the technical ability that was on display, but the not like— oh my gosh, I can't believe I scored, but just sort of like, yeah, that's what I do. This yeah, is my yeah. job. And not like a celebrating in your face yeah. kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, that, that's true. That's a good professional performance from a lot of guys who are professional soccer players. This is true. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> One of whom was Alex Mendez. Yes. Quick, quick report, scouting oh, by yeah. Russell Varner. Uh, Alex Mendez, 18-year-old American midfielder for SC Freiburg. Uh, Mendez started and went the full 90 in the U- U-20's 7-1 demolition of Puerto Rico on Thursday. He was the most aggressive midfielder of the three that started, and his initial pressure and interception led to the U.S.'s first goal. He would later add a goal to his tally 
after chasing down a ball that was crossed into the box Mm -hmm. and finishing it with a nice touch into the bottom left corner using his weaker foot. Well done, Alex Mendez. Do we have any other scouting reports from guys who played in this game? I I do not believe we do. Okay, so... Mendes was impressive mm-hmm. every time. So I didn't see the whole game. I saw I saw it in chunks. Um, he seemed to be a guy that was winning and then creating. Right, he would win the ball, but then he would actually not just do like a simple mm-hmm. pass. He would split a couple of people with a pass. He looked like the best midfielder yeah. to me. Paxton Pomacal looked mm-hmm. exciting. Yep. He looked like um, he wore number ten, I believe. But because we played the Tab Ramos four one four one, he was on one of the wings. He might have had a spell on either the right or the left was very dribbly and tricky. He even had a goal where he dribbles around the keeper, right? Mm-hmm. So good performance from Paxton Pomacal. There's a lot of players I could end up listing yeah. um, who played well, but those are the two things that stood out to me. Yeah, I think I think the, the key point for me, though, is while there were lots of players who had good games and scored lots of goals, it's a little bit, in my mind, similar to uh, the U.S. women in CONCACAF qualifying or the mm-hmm. CONCACAF championship. Last month or so? Of like, let's wait till we play whoever the equivalent of Canada is. Yeah. Probably Mexico. Like, let's wait until we make it to that next round to really get too excited because yeah. we're playing teams. Like, who lost? Like, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, did they lose like 13 nothing or something 13 like two. that? 13 2. 13 yeah. 2. I can't was it St. Vincent or did Canada no, okay. just barely beat St. Okay, so this Trinidad is... barely beat St. Vincent. There it is. Yeah, Trinidad beat St. Vincent 3 2 in mm-hmm. the 95th minute goal from Judy Garcia yeah. um, US Virgin Islands lost 13-2 to to one of those teams oh, my, I, thought he was, I thought he was coming to a game. Yeah, it's fine but my, my point is simply that I don't want to get too thrilled about the way these players looked yes. and how sharp they looked because until we meet a little bit of stiffer opposition that mm-hmm. will tell us what this team is truly made of and then unfortunately for the players that we're watching some mm-hmm. of them might get replaced There's by that. the time we get to the second possibly. round yeah, possibly possibly yeah um, Okay, so mm-hmm. I think that's all we need to say about the US under 20s, right? Um, CONCACAFGO.com, where you can stream these games. Yeah, or, wasn't su- or see the spinning loading Yeah, it wasn't thing. successful for everybody, but mm. I will say this in CONCACAFGO's defense. It is in beta, it says beta yeah. in the top left corner, and it is free, right? So at least you're not paying for it like I'm paying for ESPN+. Plus. Can't wait for them to get it marginally working, and then they'll charge. <laughs> uh, to the scouting network, shall we go? Yeah, but can you start us off? Because I can't find the uh, I sure the can. Uh, I can start us off by uh, mentioning a player who we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, Jake Lamar scouting Austin Trusty, the 20-year-old American defender for the Philadelphia Union. Okay. Uh, a quick recap of this one because it's some stuff we've already talked about. Basically, uh, on decision day, Austin and the Union did not have a very good outing against NYCFC, losing 3-1. to one. Oh, we forgot to mention it was a repeat result. We yeah. did. Uh, Austin scored an own goal on a slice clearance on a low-driven cross with his weaker foot. That meant they gave up home field advantage in the first round, instead had to go to New York where as we said they once again did not have a very good game losing again 3-1 to one. and just to, to dip back into this it makes me realise that if they lost 3-1 at Yankee Stadium mm-hmm. maybe they should have gone with a different game plan maybe. for the second go round maybe <sighs> um, okay Russell Varner we've already uh, mm-hmm. read Russell Varner's Alex Mendes report and David Kishber's uh, Jeremy Obobese yep. report Anurang Ganjaria is scouting Andrea Novakovic the 22 year old American striker on loan at Fortuna Sittard from Reading. Mm-hmm. Um, Anurag says, um, according to a recent article by the Reading Chronicle, Reading manager Paul Clement has admitted that nobody from the club has spoken to or seen Novakovic play this season. Yeah. This doesn't make any sense given that one, Novakovic signed a new two year deal with Reading this summer, and two, Reading are in the relegation zone and struggling to score goals. For a team that could really use a striker, it's concerning that they don't seem to care how one of their top striker prospects is doing. Yeah. And it's worth remembering, like, Reading didn't let Novakovic go to the last U-20 World Cup. They basically said, like, no, we need him. You can't take him. And then they don't really know what's going on with him. That's mm-hmm. a weird decision by Reading. Bad Reading, I say. Is. I, I want to say uh, thank you to Anorak, though, because mm-hmm. that is good scouting. It right? sure That's is. That's finding some news that we didn't know about and uh, adding a bit more to the Novakovic story. You are correct, my friend. Uh, Nicholas Arjona scouting, or Arjona scouting, uh, Andy Sullivan, 22-year-old American midfielder for the Washington Spirit. After coming second in the Rookie of the Year voting, even though she led all rookies in minutes played, says... <laughs> Nicholas, uh, Nicholas sounds better. Nicholas Sourly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andy was called... <laughs> <laughs> Andy was called up to the most recent U.S. Women's National Team camp for their games against Portugal and Scotland. Also sco- uh, called up for those games, Danny Colaprico, yeah. who was our guest um, in Chicago, yep. Chicago Red Stars midfielder. I, we did it. I, I really I really think we played a part in that. <laughs> I'm sure we did. Her fearsome onstage performance. Yep. Um, 
<laughs> that was what did it. Yeah, that, I think that's what put her over Be the edge. Be sure to claim that to her publicly. Yeah, I'm sure definitely. Well. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, who else we got? Um, Ira Jersey is scouting Ashley Sanchez, 19 year old American attacker for UCLA. Um, as goes Ashley, so goes UCLA, says Ira. Since losing to number one Stanford by a single goal, UCLA has gone on an eight game winning streak uh, during which time Ashley played every match. She got six goals, six assists in that time. Her smart runs have gotten her into great scoring positions. She continues to press high, winning the ball in dangerous areas to create chances. Chances. Sounds like what you'd want her doing on the women's national team. Correct. Um, an exemplar of this form, thanks, Jaira, was her game winner in a match away at Colorado where Ashley pressed him on the ball in the penalty area, calmly hit a shot back the other way into the side netting. She currently leads UCLA in both goals and assists. The Sanchez is back, says Ira. <laughs> the Sanchez. <laughs> Uh, David uh, Novoshevsky scouting Sebastian Szymanski, the 19-year-old Polish midfielder for Ligia Warsaw. Excellent pronunciation. Thank you. Uh, Szymanski, well, Szymanski was written out phonetically by oh. David. Thank oh, you, David. Well, our listeners did. Now, I'm trying to, you know, fully transparent here, Daryl. <laughs> Szymanski continues to perform well for club and country. The Poland U21s advanced to the playoffs for the 2019 European Championship after a 1-1 to draw with Denmark and a 3-0 victory over Georgia. They will face Portugal in a home-and-home series in November. You don't like that so terminology, both games right? Are pl- both games are played I forgot you hate yeah. that term. Uh, <laughs> you prefer home and away. Uh, Shemainsky continues to perform well f- uh, for Ligia as they move uh, as they move to the top of the <laughs> extra classa. So I feel like I've thrown you off your game. Uh-huh. Fun side note: uh, Shemainsky has a has a a very nice tattoo of the Holy Rosary on his left forearm. <laughs> says David. <laughs> Did you feel like it would be blasphemy to say that word too close to the Holy Rosary? A little bit. Um, Ryan Marzak is scouting Josh. Because I'm so religious. Onomar, the 21 year old English midfielder on loan at Sheffield Wednesday from Tottenham. Sheffield Wednesday has been a great move for the English Madrid so far, says Ryan. Onomar has been in the starting lineup four of the last five matches, is tied for the team lead in assists, and has been a key piece of the Wednesday attack. Mm-hmm. Go on, Joshua. Keith Kombach scouting Marcelo Palomino, the 17 year old American winger for the Houston Dynamo. Uh, we're we're going to talk about Palomino in the sense that rumors suggest that he has departed the Houston Academy to go on trial with a few different clubs in Europe. And by rumors, we mean we found a Reddit post. We did. We yeah. found a Reddit post indeed. Um, Todd Ito is scouting Takafusa Kubo, the 17-year-old Japanese attacker for Yokohama F. Marinas. Um, Todd says the Japanese under-19 national team advanced to the semis of the AFC Championships with Kubo playing up top in a 4-4-2 and getting multiple assists. However... Saudi Arabia stunned Japan 2-0 in the semi. Japan chose to rest a number of players, including Kubo, perhaps with an eye towards playing career in the final, and they paid the price. Don't look past your semi-final opponents. Dylan Vietz scouting Kai Havertz, 19-year-old German midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Kai scored twice in Leverkusen's 6-2 victory over Bremen. On, for Kai. his first, Kai unexpectedly beat his man with pace. I'm not sure if that means because Kai is slow or because... <laughs> Maybe it's just not his usual thing. Yeah. Um, and calmly chipped the keeper as the keeper went to ground. The second came 10 minutes later when Havertz scored from a low-driven cross with his trailing foot. Dylan asks is, uh, if this name has if this move has a name. Um, and it's similar to what uh, Aaron Ramsey did against Fulham recently. It's I like see. the ball comes across. And it, it's usually basically if you are like a right-footed player and you don't feel like comfortable using the outside of your left foot uh-huh. to try to put the ball on frame, you'll use the inside of your right foot. Like from a plant position. Oh, I think of it as like if you've overrun it, then this is your um, this is your next move. If you've missed the ball, that could be. Yeah. I've definitely I've definitely tried doing it when I was like, nah, maybe not that one, but yes, definitely this oh, one. Really? Or I just know I can. But also, you're putting a little bit more disguise on it, so That's maybe the that thing, throws right? the keeper it's too. To, it's to trick the. Keeper. I did that in indoor one. You play. You dr- like. Sh- I think it was like a pass shot to me. Uh, in our last indoor game, one hundred percent a pass. Sure, sure, sure. One hundred percent a pass. Either way, uh, it was probably a shot. But also, either <laughs> way, uh, I don't know if it does have a name. Daryl, do you want to give it a name? I'd love to, but I can't think of one. Um, the- let's, just, let's just call it the Daryl Grove and see if it catch, catches on. <laughs> a move that I don't think I've ever seen you do, but I think we should just call it that. <laughs> I'm going to think on that, see if I can... Grove uh, strike. The Grove, grove <laughs> strike. Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, James Porter is scouting Delhi Ali, the mm-hmm. 22-year-old English midfielder for Tottenham. Uh, Delhi made his return from injury against Man City when he came on in the 75th minute with Spurs down 1-0. Um, he got 25 yards and two touchdowns. <laughs> he then started in Spurs League Cup victory over West Ham and assisted on both of Son's goals um, even better news he also signed a six year contract extension to keep him at Spurs until 2024 well done Delhi. well done Spurs ish Brandon Colvin scouting Brahim Diaz the 19 year old Spanish winger for Manchester City after several months firmly on the periphery of the squad Brahim Diaz scored his first senior goal and his second senior team goal in City's 2-0 win over Fulham in the Carabao Cup's fourth round Diaz started the game as a right wing 
winger and provided consistent, energetic interplay in addition to bagging a poacher's brace. He netted his first after <laughs> that dark. That really sounds like he shot two pheasants. It does. A poacher's brace. <laughs> uh, it does, it's, he illegally shot two pheasants. Can you say that phrase real fast? I feel like it should be said with an English accent. A poacher's brace. There we are. Yeah. Uh, he netted his first after darting into the box to you claim... You are hereby charged with a poacher's brace. That's that's a different one. That's when you've, I think, hunted in a national park. Uh, he netted his first after darting into the box to claim a spilled ball from a city short corner and notched the second in a similar fashion, charging into space with composure to put away the rebound from a Gabriel Jesus shot that pinged off the post. Okay, I think I've got a name for the, the goal that Kai Havertz scored. Mm-hmm. I want to call it the plant foot surprise. Because it's your plant foot and you don't know it's coming. So it's the plant foot surprise. Oh, I, oh, I got it. Yeah? <laughs> I got it. Not liking it? <laughs> I, I like the Grove Strike. But the if you want to go, strike. the plant foot surprise. Yeah. Well, at least it's more um, descriptive. It's right, right up there with Elastico in terms of just how like uh, catchy that one is. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I dig it. If you want to go with that one, you can go with that one. I want to read the final scouting report <laughs> and get out of it. All right. Chase Paul is scouting Getson Fernandez, the 19-year-old Portuguese midfielder for Benfica. Chase says that Getson has been playing regular minutes for Benfica in league and cup play, as well as in the Champions League. Um, he scored from a million yards out, if you round up, in a 3-0 third round Taca de Portugal placard win over third-tier club uh, Centenis FC. I think that's the cup, right? Taco mm-hmm. de Portugal. Um, Getson also made the shortlist of the 20 finalists for the 2018 Golden Boy, but Kylian Mbappe is definitely going to win it. Yeah. <laughs> How about, all right, I can go plant foot surprise if we call it a piff. It's a like, piff. oh, he piffed it. So plant foot surprise. Well, oh, he piffed PFS. it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> piffs. Piffs. He piffed it. <laughs> I like how That's, much you, I like how much you like it. I'm I I like how much our listeners have to enjoy a series of unpleasant noises being made oh, in their earbuds. You know what we're gonna have to do? Uh-huh. The we've put the thing up on the board yeah. days since our last nonsense. Yeah, it's gone back to zero. We've got it? up to two. <laughs> yep, we're gonna have to reset the clock. Not quite as nonsensical as unicorn noises, but still kind not, of nonsensical. It's not far away. Nah. It's not far away. <laughs> Whatever. All right, that, I think that will do us. That's what I say. <laughs> I think that'll do us yeah. um, here at Total Soccer Show. Well, one final thing uh, that we want to remind people mm-hmm. um, is, I mean, thank you for listening this yep. far. This is a deep show. Um, election yep. is Tuesday, November 6th. Please get out there and vote. Um, we don't want to tell you specifically which candidates to vote for. Unless you live in the Central Virginia area, in which yeah. case don't vote for Dave Bratt. <laughs> yes, don't vote for Dave Bratt. Yeah. Maybe don't vote for any candidate that's going to support um, a lying racist. <laughs> Fair? Yes. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> Anything to add, Taylor? No, nope, just a yep. uh, super awkward note to end on. Yeah. Hey, I didn't say his name, but I think the fact that everybody knows exactly who I'm talking about <laughs> is proof, is proof. Um, if you want to email us to complain, uh, send it to uh, no thank you at totalsoccershow.com. <laughs> Remember to get out and vote Tuesday, November 6th. It is very important. It sure is. Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening. Taylor, stick to sports, <laughs> unless it's really important. Uh-huh. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you again on Monday.